production of Ruckus is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Hartwig family, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. This week marks the beginning of our 20th season on KCPT. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckettes join me shortly in our topics this week. Missouri legislators study school choice. Want a choice in local airports? How about Joe Co. International? And they call it the Trump bump, plus roast and toast. But we start with our newsmaker segment and talk with one of the new members of the Kansas legislature. Joy Coaston of Leewood won the House seat in the 28th District in her first run for elective office. She based her campaign on three key issues, tax structure, education, and local control. Representative Coaston is a Republican, a college professor with a doctorate in communications study. Representative Coaston, welcome to Ruckus. Thanks for coming in. It's good to see you. Thank you, Mike. It's terrific to be here. Uh, was there any one event or one issue that made you say, you know, I've thought about this. I'm going to do it. I'm going to run. <laughs> well, funny enough, I had not really given it serious thought uh, until uh, about a year ago in December, and I kept uh, trying to understand some of the crazy policy decisions that were being made by the uh, previous legislature. And um, my husband and I uh, had a very pivotal moment one day when he looked at me, he said, Joy, posting things on Facebook isn't going to change anything. <laughs> if, you wanna, if you really want to change something, then run for office. And I kind of shook my head and said, oh, whatever. And then I happened to say the same thing to a group of women. Uh, in my community uh, at a gathering and I said you know some days I just get so frustrated mm -hmm. I think I should run for office and they cornered me and they said well we think we you should too <laughs> and that was the beginning of conversations that led me to um, to decide to run. And, and you ran in a primary against the Republican incumbent in the district you won the primary there was no Democratic opponent so That's you true. didn't have to run in the general election. That is true. That now is true. there are there are different brands of Republicans we hear about in Kansas mm -hmm either conservatives or moderate. Are you the more moderate in terms of a Republican philosophy? Yes, I, yeah, I would. I am joining a wonderful cohort of moderate uh, Republicans and Democrats who really want to face uh, our, can our problems in Kansas and try to figure out common sense solutions to uh, making our state function the way that we think it should function. What do you think the essential difference is between a conservative Republican and a Republican like you, a moderate Republican? Well, I think moderate Republicans are worried about fiscal policy. They're really trying to understand what's the best interest of the state. Uh, we're not as concerned with social issues. Uh, uh, we're, we're more focused on what, what it is we need to run the state effectively. Uh, being <laughs> being uh, interested in, in finding that balanced tax formula. W would you say you're more pragmatic? Much more pragmatic about getting the, getting the job done, understanding what the problems are. Um, I don't think that we truly understand well, what the right. problems are. Let, let's talk about some problems. You said the tax structure needs to be changed. Mm -hmm. What do you want to change? Well, I think one of the first things that has to happen is we have to roll back the loophole on the LLC. It's not just the LLC issue, but um, for example, my husband and I own a business in Overland Park. We received that tax cut. Uh, it's, it's Did you have to take it? Uh, I suppose we could have given it back, uh, but I, I never, that never came. So you want to see a rollback of the that, LLC yeah, exemption? Absolutely. We don't have enough money to run, to run the services of the state. And there are 300 and some thousand people who have taken there advantage of that yeah. and who simply followed the law as you did. Absolutely. Uh, you also expressed concern about local control. Local control of what? Well, I think, first of all, school finance. Uh, if we don't have the ability to um, use that local option budget to raise the the taxes in our communities to help educate our children the way we wish to educate them. I think it inhibits us. Uh, Blue Valley schools in particular, Shawnee Mission schools certainly have to stay above. J just to clarify, there is a local option budget, but There's a you want to make lid. it higher, exactly right? I think it has to be with the, within the will of the people of the communities to decide whether or not they wish to be taxed more for a better base for education. Overall in Kansas, you think schools are insufficiently financed? I do. 
Do you expect the Supreme Court to order about $500 million more for education? I do. How do you expect the state to pay for it? What do you want to cut, or how do you think that money is going to become available? I think that is the big question. How will we, how will we do that? Well, I'm glad I asked the big <laughs> yeah. question. I think everybody that I talk to says, well, what's your, you know, what do you want to fix in Kansas? I said, well, you can't do anything until you fix the budget, and, and the budget can't be fixed quickly. So until we have a comprehensive tax reform that levels the playing field, that we are able to actually um, raise enough revenue to do what's necessary in the state, we aren't going to fix anything. Got to wrap this up. Quick answer. Uh, the session starts next week. Are you optimistic? I am because I think they're tremendous opportunities uh, and we have a wonderful coalition of people going up. We have 47 new legislators uh, going up uh, in, uh, in in a, a week, and I think that everybody is very excited about being able to work together. So right. I am optimistic. Thanks very much for coming in. You'll have to come back and see us when the session is over and tell us if it was a success or not. Thanks. I, I hope I get to do so. Okay. Thank you. And that was Kansas State Representative Joy Coaston. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. Jason Grill is a senior advisor at Paris Communications. Ron Freeman is a motivational speaker and writer. Mary O'Halloran is a media and communications consultant. And Woody Kozad is president of the Kozad Company, a government relations firm. Welcome to all of you. Thanks for coming in. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thank, you. Thank you. While we just finished talking about education in Kansas, as we often have on Ruckus, let's take a look at the situation on the Missouri side. As a new Republican governor and GOP-controlled legislature get back into action, it seems likely that a lot of time will be spent on choice. Not abortion choice, but school choice. Governor-elect Greitens views on education are not fully known, but his party and general philosophy seem to suggest that he'd be open to a wide range of options, such as tougher tenure policies and basing teachers' pay on student achievement. Dr. Michael McShane, the Director of Education Policy at the Show Me Institute in Kansas City, says it is time to decouple where children live and where they go to school. So what about all of this, Mary? Would you describe yourself as pro-choice on education? I would. I'm pro-choice on education now, and I always have been, and that's my probably because of my personal experiences. I am a graduate of K through 12 private uh, public schools, except for a couple of years in a Catholic school. I went to a Catholic university, but I represented a great state university in Iowa when I was a state lawmaker, and I've had all kinds of experiences with public and private schools. And what's necessary when we're talking about this issue is to understand that Republicans have framed this issue of vouchers and how the state can start paying for private and religious education. Now, you're not for that kind of choice, right? Absolutely. Well, that's not necessarily choice. What it is is... Well, it is the choice, choice of the parents to decide whether to the send their children to school. It's, choice it's going to so drain money, Mike. It's going to drain money from... In, in a state like Missouri where they have but, but not just to yet... But we understand what it is. Just to be clear, you're not in favor of that. You're in favor of people I being able to send their children wherever they can have, afford to send them. Here in Kansas City, parents oh have 16 or 17 charter schools. We have all kinds of religious schools, public schools. Right. We've got all kinds of choice to start mm -hmm. with. But the, kind, we, first in truth, but we the kind we don't have is the kind that the Republicans want now. Which, which is state funding which so is the parents state can decide funding where to send of, their children. So they have private schools paid for by the, the taxpayers. And, and Betsy DeVos, the new choice of Trump for Secretary of Education, is virulently anti-public education. She has never attended a public school, or children never have, and she's Kind of like Obama. She's opposed. <laughs> yeah. He attended public schools most of his young life and a great state university. All right, uh, Jason, a uh, couple of things. First, where do you come down on this question of the state funding school choice for parents and children. And secondly, you were in the state legislature. Did you have to deal with this a lot? Uh, I tend to agree with Mary. I think there already is choice. We see a lot of great charter schools here in Kansas City. I think we need to continue to be more innovative, and I don't think both sides should be so hard-nosed, and they should try to find a way to work together on this. Second, Matt Blunt was governor when I was in office for two Republican. years. Republican. And every year this came up, and uh, there was a Republican legislature, Republican governor, and it didn't have the votes to get passed. Uh, obviously, when Jay Nixon was governor, it 
uh, didn't have a shot. But now I think it might have a shot, but we'll see, because it didn't back then, so maybe it will back now. And Ron, uh, opposition to school choice, the kind we're talking about, right. has come primarily from teachers unions. Why would they be opposed? Well, I, I think that from a political standpoint, you want to make sure when you give choice to people, you give choice to the least advantage. Those who don't have an opportunity to go forward otherwise. And when we talk about choice at this table right now, so far it's been we all have choice. Well, there, we know that there's a subculture that doesn't have a choice. And so targeting them is what's important. As far as the teachers unions, they're going to act in their best interest. They're going to try and get what they want out of the deal. And I think when you talk about school choice, you're talking about giving people who don't have the power of a union, they don't have the power of economic resources to get there. So what you're seeing now is to those people, well, everybody else has choice. We're not going to worry about you. I think it's time to give those people a choice. Well, uh, all, the, all the proposals that have come up would like automatically make children or, or students that are in public schools or private schools recipients of these state equalization or state uh, education it? grants. Let's, could we Would you it? like to do that, we really? Uh, <laughs> what, what we, let's all remember something. This is how we run higher education. Everybody gets some kind of a subsidy from the government, a student loan, a Pell Grant, something. And they get to take it to any school they want to take it to. Want to take it to a Catholic school, go to a CAG. Want to go to a private school, go to a public school. And gosh, it seems to work. Now, we have that system because the people you're going to shove around if you try to abolish that are middle and upper middle class white people. And you don't push them around, you lose the next election. But if the people you're pushing around are at 31st and Tracy and they're black and they're poor, which is who we won't give a right. choice to today, you well, can get away and, with it. And that. the idea of choice would be to benefit minority families, minority and family, poor families, poor families, people who do not have the resources, <laughs> and the state share, not the local. The right. state share of their funding, they could take to any school they want. And quickly, well, Woody, you, to wrap you it up, the, the Trump administration they have never has. Funded the wait a minute, I think I was asking a question. Never funded uh, What's that got to do I, with I believe I was in the middle of a question. Oh, wow. uh, the Trump Not administration much. has obviously a pro choice tilt, and Betsy DeVos, <laughs> the education Absolutely. secretary designate, is very much in favor of school choice. What role will that play in Missouri, Kansas, elsewhere in the states, the fact that you'd have the federal government behind this? Well, it, it, not a large role, but it will have this much, that you will not have the Department of Education trying to get in the way and put a stick in the spokes of whatever the state government decides it wants to do. And in a Democratic administration, you would. Okay. I'm going to move ahead. The Ruckus Flexibility Award goes to Kansas City Star columnist Steve Rose, who in a complete change of pace is now calling for the Kansas City Council to bypass voters and build a new one-terminal Kansas City airport. Rose fears voters would turn it down. Never mind that the local government has assured voters that they, and not the city council, would have the final word. Rose also believes that Johnson Countyans, who make up one of every four KCI travelers, are becoming frustrated and may consider the possibility of a Kansas side facility. He points to the new Century Air Center near Olathe. It's not a threat, says Steve, only a possibility if the one terminal project does not proceed. Well, Ron, are you ready for Olathe International? Well, you know, if they want to do that, I'm sure they will. Uh, but I don't think Johnson County said, let's see what Kansas City does before we act in our own interest. But here's the thing, is that KCI, and I've traveled all over the U.S. I've been in you know, Philadelphia, Denver, New York. Uh, Kansas City has a fine airport. It works. It's very efficient, very functional, and it worked. I, to me, it's the best one around. I like it. I enjoy KCI, the way it's set up its structure. It works for me quite well. The problem that, you know, Mr. Rose and everybody else has to deal with is if you're going to take public money, the public votes. Where's that going to come from? <laughs> the public Property votes. taxes? No, I'm saying if you're going to take public money to, to fund the airport, the public well, should vote. That was, that was a promise made by a previous city council and yes. the current mayor, it I believe. Wasn't needed, I think so legally, that, that's, yes, I would think legally, the Not city legally, could have done it on its own. It doesn't have to ask but, for a vote, but it guaranteed that a vote would take place. Yeah, but, yeah. And that's the, the fundamental issue here is if it's doable and it's economically uh, going to be profitable for whoever owns it, why wouldn't Olathe to do it? They don't, they're not going to wait for uh, Kansas City. Olathe wouldn't do it because of like, where would the money come that's, from? Yeah. Oh, oh, but, oh, but, but so before Kansas we get city to, money, before we yeah, get, there we go. Before we get to the money, Mary, uh, Steve <laughs> says that Johnson Countyans are kind of upset with what they experience at KCI. Have oh. you detected any of that unhappiness? You know, I don't know. Drive. Steve writes his columns, and he yeah. always will find somebody <laughs> that's dissatisfied in Johnson County. Johnson Countyans like the convenience of that airport. I mean, how many times do we have to say this? 
if they're going to sell a, a go get the bulldozers and tear it down and build a nice Denver like straight line, <sighs> you know, uh, for the, for the airlines. Terrible. Feel free, put it on the ballot of something of that sort. But, you know, the, the smart people in town have been trying to go for a middle road. And Steve and others just won't talk middle about it. Middle road is what, renovations at KCI? A redesign and reno renovation. And Steve Rose led the effort to redesign <laughs> and renovate Union Station. And look what it did for right. our city. This can be done. We're a city full of architects. I'm for whatever gets us more direct flights. That's the most important thing because <laughs> well, all these people from San Francisco to Austin to New York, they want to bring businesses here and they have to have direct flights. There has to be direct flights from Kansas City to all these places. If it doesn't improve, we're not going to see well, more job there's, growth. There's a real effort, is there not, Jason, by the mayor and the uh, Chamber of Commerce right. to, to push the idea of a new one terminal airport? Oh, That's yes. a high priority for those it, folks. Yes, it is. I mean, I think we need to do something and it's going to have to happen this year or next year. But, I mean, we need more direct flights. That's what I care about as and a And the traveler. answer is the one terminal If Southwest is going to deliver more direct well, flights, the I'm also going to pay for Southwest airport. will guarantee that, uh, then tear down and build a new one. But you know what? They won't. They won't and good. the reason they won't is because, uh, sadly, and I think mistakenly in the long run, the model is changing. And Southwest's model was to serve the secondary airports and to hop, right. make short right. hops. Now they want to save fuel, and they burn fuel getting up and going down, mm -hmm. so they want to do longer flights. They're going to do, put flights in here on the basis of demand. It's either there or it's not. And for the last few years, it's mostly been ticking a little down. It's going up, though, now. And well, so in the lately. last year, it went up a little. <laughs> but a the long-range trend has not been great. And I, so I, all I know is Southwest will fly the flights in here that the bodies will get on and pay them money. But they're their business model is shifting to longer range flights and that's not good for Kansas well, City and it isn't well, the St. Louis is well, picking up a lot of our here's flights Here's what now. I don't understand with Steve Rose. How can you possibly make the suggestion that the way to get the public support for the bulldozer approach is to tell the people they can't vote? <laughs> Here we have a new plan. You don't get to have your say Shouldn't in all more of this. people vote than just Kansas City? Let, let me ask you this, Jason. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Steve, and, 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 yeah. Steve says that it would be impossible for a public relations or advertising campaign to change the public's mind about That's KCI. Now you're in that It'd business. Be, it, it's is, not is an easy. That, road, is let's is be he honest. right? <laughs> is is he, there he no way? Some, he's right in some respects, but I mean, if, if we could actually see what what the improvements would be, and we can get more flights guaranteed and all these things, I don't think. It'd be hard at all. What this you're tells not, you're not me is that for it. what this tells me is that they have figured out that the money people are not prepared to come up with the money for that yeah, campaign. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Can, can, yeah. can we conclude by agreeing that they're not going to change KCI without a vote of the public, and we're not likely oh, to see so. Olathe sporting a new passenger yeah, airport exactly. anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> They'll right. yeah. 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 wait till after flight. filing closes there for the go. city council. It is it is called the Trump bump and refers to the soaring stock market and rising consumer confidence readings following Donald Trump's election to the presidency. From the election to early December, the Dow Jones average climbed 1,200 points, and the Consumer Confidence Index closed the year at a high of 113.7, the highest level since 2003. The positivity is apparently based on the future president's promise of lower taxes, more jobs, and fewer regulations. If those promises come to fruition, Woody, what will happen with the U.S. economy? Well, look, the U.S. economy goes up and goes down. Uh, that's called the business cycle. Uh, the government, I think, mostly slows or accelerates that some. And the long-range trend is that they've been slowing it. Uh, the, the recoveries take longer and they're shallower. They don't go as high as the preceding recovery. So the long-range trend is very bad. Part of that, somebody has to explain to me why the United States of America should have the highest corporate tax in the world. Why would that? Why well, would we want to have? That's one of the things Trump proposes. That's right. Is the and and the why we tax. would be one of only five countries that, when you pay your subsidiary pays a tax in Germany of twenty percent, then when you send your money back to America, we take another fifteen to get you up. Well, then that lesson is keep your money in Europe, which is what they're well, doing. It's pretty much Republican right. just, orthodoxy, is it not, that if you do these things, lower taxes, cut yes. regulations, yep. the create long more range, jobs, uh, the long then the economy flourishes. Of that has to be to, for the economy to become more active. Corporate income tax needs to be 
change. So on do, a you, national do, you, level. do you make these same? It doesn't work as well in Missouri. Do you, I know that. Do you make these same assumptions as Donald Trump does? That you make these changes and we'll see a flourishing U.S. economy? I don't know about that, but I think that we see this after most presidents, uh, their honeymoon period, the stock market goes up. The only one that hadn't was President Obama, which went down. President Clinton went up. Uh, well, but Reagan like, went up, not, not oh, to this extent. Not to, not turned to, around. <laughs> right, he did, but <laughs> but this happens all the time. A 9% growth, this is what, 13%? So we'll see what happens when they actually have to make laws and put these things in action because that's the hard part. Well, but Ron, well, this is the Republican <laughs> dream, is it not? You have the House, you have the Senate, you have the White House, and soon you're going to have the Supreme Court, I assume. Yeah, if, right. if Republicans can't get it done this time, when will they? That, that would be a problem. But the fact is you have a CEO in the White House. You have a person that the, the financial world likes him. And I think that's what we're seeing right now. The challenge is going to be when you get in the Congress and whether it's uh, the majority who might have their own personal agendas that be opposition or the opposition party that says we're going to try and put a stop. And, and you know, here's a wild card. What's the former President Obama going to be doing? Is he going to be a champion against uh, Trump's initiatives, because that's going to play a factor in all this that's going on right now. So it's going to be a lot. Oh, and, and now, a Mary, lot you're going to be infrastructure. Mary, Mary, infrastructure. Mary, you're going to like this. Uh, what about President Obama? He came into office when the economy was in a steep decline. Right. Does he not deserve some credit for this economy? Oh my goodness! What he de and I, I'll bet even Woody would agree with this. What he deserves credit for is the steady hand that he used in building the economy back. And you're right, it was gradual, but it was never negative. There was not a single quarter of negative growth in the American economy after he took office when, remember folks, what Stats. it was like that day. And what was like that month, we were losing hundreds of thousands of jobs a, a month, a day, a week. So what's happened is, and, and, and if you don't mind, Mike, I'd like to quote at the Deloitte University a survey of economic growth. How long growth, will it take? About 30 <laughs> seconds. Uh, their too long. their uh, uh, look at this was published in October, but it was been quoted by Trump people, actually gave Obama's administration the credit because American people's income is going up. Their attitudes are better. The economic growth that we've seen is positive. And, you know, he but, has... But, but it's low compared to what, what other wages presidents Wages are going up. I mean, uh, that's, that's the best. But it's going up. That's the point. Well, well but, but it started in the last year. Yeah. It started the, the yeah. first market quarter. Unemployment, yeah. unemployment, yeah. Unemployment's yeah. Low it, it, it started the first quarter he was in office. And job growth was very slow during the Obama years. Overall, it's 2 percent All right, just a quick question. There's not been anything dramatic. Ron, traditionally the press gives a new president, couple of months, a brief honeymoon, if you will. Now, some will argue that Obama got a honeymoon for eight years, but do you think the press is going to give Donald Trump a honeymoon? No, they're too invested. You look at the election, they were so committed to his defeat, that now it's no way. Anything that goes negative, they're going to pounce on it. If it's positive, they're going to question whether or not it's even legit. So yeah, he's not going to get a break from it. It's tweet, not going to happen. I, I, I want to ask happen. you about that, because I know you're an active user it. of yeah. uh, uh, Twitter. Twitter, yeah. Twitter, I'm sorry. Anyway, many in the press criticize Trump for using that, using that device. But isn't that a good tool for him to stay in touch with his very yes. large constituency? I as think, like I mean, a following of 25, I don't agree with what he tweets million? all the time, but I think it's a great oh, avenue to get in front of all the people <laughs> quickly. He doesn't have to do press conferences. He can just issue tweets. I mean, it's... It's wow, smart. It's what a freedom control the message. For a president it's not smart to though. have to stand it's up in front of the media and answer oh, oh, a question. I'm, I'm just saying he's doing, a a he's doing a news conference. He's doing a news conference next week. He said. Well, now he, we he head to that. the soapbox for roast and toast, <laughs> where the Ruckheads have 30 seconds each to give a hug or a shrug <laughs> to people and events in the news. And we start with Woody. Well, it's happened again. Somebody with the initials J.C. has risen from the dead. In this case, however, it's John Calhoun who believed that a state legislature should be able to nullify federal laws. Apparently, he has risen from the dead in California, where the legislature vows that everything Trump does that it doesn't like, it's going to pass a law effectively nullifying that. I thought we fought a civil war over this, and as I recall, the nullification guys lost. I just took a course in civil war history at Mizzou this semester. <laughs> I'm sure that's how it turned out. Apparently, nobody told California. 
Jason. I usually toast the great things happening in Kansas City, but I have to roast the University of Missouri basketball program. As a Missouri law alum, I am extremely frustrated with Mizzou. If, if uh, Kim Anderson's a great guy, but he was a bad hire at the time, he's, he's got to move on now. We were losing to teams that have terrible records, and it's very frustrating as a Mizzou person. And if the Chiefs weren't doing so well, it'd be a tough winner in Kansas City for this Mizzou guy. All right, Mary. Well, with a heavy heart, but a but just a just a mind full of esteem for the current president of the United States, I want to toast uh, Barack Obama for the last time that I will have a chance to do that. He gave this country something we never had before: an African American president, a president who was opposed in the Congress on every possible thing he could come up with, who refused to compromise with him on basic policy. But in spite of that fact, he will, I think, be uh, understood as a productive and um, successful president, and thank God that he worked on and succeeded on getting an international agreement on climate change. Run. Well, I'm going to tone it down a little bit from the political. I, I want to toast Andy <laughs> Reid and the Kansas City Chiefs for winning the AFC West and uh, bringing some energy to Kansas City that we needed. Uh, and I'm very proud of the Kansas City Chiefs. All right. And finally, as we start our 20th season of Ruckus, a toast to the many who are part of Ruckus history. To our first panelists, two of whom still appear, Steve Rose and Steve Glorioso, to those panelists who are no longer with us, the late Ray Morgan and the late Rich Nadler. To the many who have joined the panel on occasion and to all the current panelists who join us periodically. To those behind the scenes and to those who watch and make ruckus part of Kansas City's civic conversation. As Hillary Clinton might put it, it takes a village to raise a ruckus. And that's it for this week. We're back next Thursday at 7. Thanks for watching and good night. Thank you.